Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Fighting on Film. This week, we're going to be covering Bataan from 1943. It's an MGM picture directed by Tay Garnett, and it was written by Robert Hardy Andrews. And it basically follows uh, a ragtag platoon of men as they defend a bridge. Yeah. Well, they're like trying to deny that the Japanese the the right to rebuild the bridge, aren't they? It's like a Last Stand movie, isn't it? You know, it's like the first definitely Last Stand movie. Mm. We recently celebrated Rourke's Drift. Um, did the anniversary of that, and it's quite. It's a little bit like that, isn't it? They're you know they're waiting for a a more dominant force to come. Um, but yeah, production wise, uh, produced by MGM. Uh, again, you know, last week's go for broke was, was MGM as well. Very, yep. very prolific in this genre w- that we've found. So interesting enough, fearing a lawsuit from RKO on a film um, by John Ford. Lost Patrol. I think they bought the rights to it for like six and a half thousand dollars. So they wouldn't have a lawsuit. And, um, the executive producer Don Sherry wrote in his autobiography uh, that it was basically just a, a loose remake. Lost Patrol is sort of like the the genus of a of like a subgenre of, of war movies in that it's a small group of men defending a single position, and you get a lot of these like Lost a Stam uh, sort of like movies. Mm. Uh, so from Lost Patrol, you get Sahara with Humphrey Bogart, yeah, and yeah. then there's a couple of others, and then obviously Bataan is they obviously were concerned enough to buy the rights. Mm. to the movie so it's sort of like it's the progenitor of like these various different uh war movies that came afterwards that sort of like have that same focus on a, a small group of men defending one position i suppose that's a good point to go into with the historical context of this movie is and what, what it's actually portraying so yeah definitely the film Bataan is sort of a microcosm within the battle of Bataan, mm. which is uh the fighting retreat in the face of uh, Japanese forces in Bataan. That saw lots of small infantry battles, hand-to-hand fighting, really scrappy, very close quarter engagements. Um, and there's lots of elements from that battle that sort of make it into some of the set pieces within Bataan. Yeah. So um, later on, I'll, I'll probably mention it again, but the, there was a Filipino soldier who was uh, with the, the, the Philippine scout and he won the Distinguished Service Cross mm. um, for beating off a Japanese attack with a, with a Browning uh, medium machine gun um, before he, he got uh, into bayonet fighting. So he basically, the gun jammed, he drew his uh, 1911 pistol, killed a handful more of uh, the attacking enemy, and then was basically hand-to-hand, really badly wounded. Uh, this week's actually the anniversary of some of the heaviest fighting during the Battle of Bataan. So we thought taking a look at uh, 1943's Bataan would be a good way to sort of uh, look back on that as well. Yeah, but interesting enough, mate, it comes out in like June 1943 as well. So it's mm. only it's only like an hour, like a what a year, just over a year to the actual fighting itself. Yeah. So you know, it's quite it's quite a rare thing, really. I mean, th- there are British movies that are shot during the war as well, and there are American movies shot during the war, but usually not usually this close together. No, they, they don't normally cover the event that's just happened so quickly. Obviously, you know, we, we've covered uh, Theirs is the Glory, which does just that, but that wasn't a wartime movie, that was a post-war movie. Propaganda piece again. Um, you know, um, and actually the the MGM had uh, help from the OWI, which was basically the United States version of the Ministry of Information. All right, okay. So they, hmm. I think it was po- like post-42-ish, something like that, but early, you know, mid-war. They um they allowed, basically they said they would help with script doctoring and things like that. So they would say, look, you know, change this, keep that, you know, not really censorship, but sort of just saying, yes, this will help the war effort. Oh, this bit won't. Right. Yeah. Like a guiding hand. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Mm. And they actually, as we'll see later, they really approved of the way that the American soldiers were represented during the, the, the picture itself. Yeah. Just jumping off that. I mean, it's a very diverse cast. And oh, yeah. The, the actual soldiers that the uh that the cast is pro- portraying are all quite varied mm. you know we've got filipinos we have a black soldier which is rare you know an era of segregation still within the u.s army so it's very rare that you'd have 
you know, that on-screen depiction of a, of a black soldier in with other white soldiers. Um, and then we have obviously all the, the Filipino uh, army elements that yeah, are in there of course. as well. But that's what makes this film sort of, it makes it unique and makes it sort of refreshing. But this, you know, this yeah. is much more true to life. It's much more down to earth. You know, they were all fighting for a common cause and they were all lumped together when, when we're sort of introduced to the unit. Everyone's from a different section of the army. You know, you've got, a, there's a young lad who's in the Navy. There's a yeah. an older troop, an older um, soldier who is, he's from the chemical corps. You know, so they're all they're all really ragtag ad hoc force. Um, Kenneth Spencer plays Wesley Epps, who's the uh, black soldier. He was an opera singer by trade. Um, he found fame post-war in Germany. Robert Taylor is your big star. Uh, he plays Sergeant Bill Dane. I really like him in this. He's really good, yeah. He was a mm. former radio star, and he actually trained US Navy pilots after the film. Um, so he can, they all contributed to the war effort. Um, and then Desi Arnaz is another big name. Yeah, big household like personality, wasn't he? Yeah, I love Lucy. Fifties onwards, massive. Yeah, um, he plays Felix Ramirez. I think the the smattering of units that they're all from is really interesting. So you've got Robert Taylor, who's playing Sergeant Bill Dane, and he's with the Thirty First Infantry. Then you've got uh, an Army Air Corps Lieutenant or Lieutenant who is uh, fixing his his scout plane. I think it is. I'm not sure yeah. what kind of plane it is. How do I just anyway, come out of nowhere though? That plane. It, yeah, that's that's something we'll probably talk about later. That doesn't. That's a bit odd. Um, then we've got, as you mentioned, you've got Corporal Jake Feingold, played by Thomas Mitchell, who was in the Chemical Corps, which is really interesting. You know, yeah. Um, the Chemical Corps was responsible for things like um, smoke barrages and and that kind of thing. Professional Signals Battalion in there, lots of cavalry units. Um, yeah. As you mentioned, we've got Robert Walker, who was a musician, yeah. second class Leonard Perkett, who is an absolutely irritating character in this film. I think. Yeah, he is. Oh. Such a moaner, isn't he? Oh, I just, I, just, I just hate that character so much. But <laughs> I think you're meant to. He, like, he plays an important role, but it, God damn. <laughs> I think he's like the voice of like the person who doesn't agree that they're at war. He's like the. He's very naive. Yeah, you know. Very naive, definitely. We've got Desi Arnaz, who was National Guard, interestingly. Yeah. Uh, 192nd Tank Battalion. Um, then we've got a cook. We've got someone from the Medical Corps. And then a couple of guys from the Philippine uh, Philippine Army, yep. Corps of Engineers, and uh, also we we've got Corporal Todd, who is also ex infantry, but now sort of just milling around. Mm. And Dane thinks he knows him, but then that yep. that whole plot just fizzles out into nothing, doesn't it? Well, yeah. they kind of they kind of sort of come to a resolution at the end where it doesn't go anywhere. There's no. Pads a runtime, didn't it a bit? Yeah, sorry, that's that was uh, Lloyd Nolan, who is uh, Corporal Todd, right? And he's he's the provisional single um, uh, battalion mm. uh, attached to the twenty sixth cavalry. Yeah, so he's kind of like basically his character is uh, someone who's gone AWOL from the army after murdering someone in a in a card game. Good lord! Um, and Dane uh, Robert Taylor recognizes him because they were in the same battalion. There's a little bit of a simmering story where Dane continuously hints that he knows he knows that Todd is actually this guy called Danny Burns, mm. and then finally, when Burns is killed or when Todd's killed, um, that he kind of makes peace with him. You know, yeah, he does. For, yeah. He sort of says something like, "I I thought for a minute you'd you'd stuck me in the back, but yeah. it was actually a Japanese a Japanese soldier." Mm. It's just a, yeah, that bit doesn't really work, but. It kind of adds another layer yeah. on top of everything else. They all get their little time to shine, don't they? They all get like a little little kind of yeah. plot of their own. You know, a little, you know, they either say, oh, I want to do this or oh, I'm going to get get that plane running and, and escape or something, you know. Yeah, the, 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 um, the Army Air Corps lieutenant yeah. who wants to get his plane up and running and escape to Corregidor. So do you want to go over the plot briefly? A sentence hypnosis is that it's just a story of Sergeant Dane's squad and his ragtag American servicemen and and in their delaying action um, to deny the, the oncoming Japanese forces the use of a bridge. Mm -hmm. Um so it's quite a simple, it's quite a simple plot, really, but it's more it's more about like them as as like yeah. a unit and like banding together to fight this like really overwhelming force. 
the first two acts of the of the movie are basically a, like a character play, aren't they? Like if you've seen Long and the Short and the Tall, it sort of plays out like that a little bit. Mm. But there's a nice opening, like scrolling text, and I've got it here. It says, "When Japan struck, our desperate need was time. Time to marshal our new armies. Ninety six priceless days were fought for us with their lives by the defenders of Bataan, the Philippine army, which formed the bulk of MacArthur's infantry." fighting shoulder to soldier with the Americans. To those immortal dead who heroically stayed the wave of barbaric conquest, this picture is reverently dedicated. Immediately reading that, it's obvious that it is, it's is—it's propaganda piece as well. Yes. As we, as we mentioned, it comes out in a, well, I don't know if we've mentioned yet, it comes out in quite an important part of the war in the Pacific. You know, America started island hopping. Things are turning around. Look at what we've already done look at what we're already doing, let's keep doing it so the war's won. That's what I get from it. Yeah, no, you're right. And there's elements in there where they're like explaining to the audience why they need to keep fighting. Yeah, yeah. There's there's, there's a really interesting thing that uh, Lloyd Nolan's character, uh, Todd, does where he he's sort of like the dissenting voice throughout because he's you know, sarcastic and kind of kind of army weary, you know, I, I, I get the feel. Is, yeah, battle fatigue, definitely. Uh, and there's an interesting point where he's talking about how tough it is for everyone back home, you know, and the sacrifices they've got to make in like the most sarcastic tone possible, saying to the audience, you should be making these sacrifices. You yeah. know, these men are on the front line fighting and dying yeah. to, you know, pres- preserve freedom. And then later on, it, it really hits you over the head with like, look, these guys are really suffering. You know, like they are genuinely really like, you know, putting their all in so that... Mm. The least you can do is, you know, buy a war bond, something like that. Yeah, well, I mean that they all die. Spoilers, but they yeah, all yeah, they all die, uh, which is which is rare for a movie of this this age. Mm. They're all picked off, aren't they, one by one? They're all picked off one by one. Yeah, uh, which is you know one of the one of the parallels with Lost Patrol. Mm-hmm. Lost Patrol set in the desert, by the way. Yeah, so yeah it's not <laughs> it's not a, it's not a, a like for like remake. No. There's a lot of money for MGM to drop to then not even feature scenes that they'd paid to use from the, the Lost Patrol. It's a bit of a weird. Yeah, I, yeah, somewhere online I read it that said that scenes from the film Arena. The Lost Patrol have been included. There's no way. There's, no. there's literally nowhere no. in, in Bataan where any of Lost Patrol would have yeah. fit in. It just makes sense. But anyway, so don't believe everything you read on the internet. Uh, it doesn't make sense. They're in like the Mesopotamian desert or somewhere like i can't remember exactly where lost patrol is set but it's set in an oasis yeah exactly they're defending an oasis and in with Bataan, they're defending sort of like a, a rocky outcrop that overlooks a bridge the platoon sort of digs in yeah they're digging bloody far from the bridge don't they <laughs> they do and it's you know they are they, they don't pick the best position not really but um so they dig in the the bri- the bridge is actually blown by um, the, the the engineers who are That's with them right at the start some demolition yeah. charges yeah which is quite some spectacular model work actually it's quite yeah, good it's nice you know that very same night the Japanese start rebuilding the bridge because they need to get across to mm-hmm. carry on chasing MacArthur and the retreating army from from some of the shots and the setup shots it's very difficult to see how some of those lines of sight that the machine I think what you're supposed to get from it is that their machine gun positions are basically very slightly set back from the edge of the ravine that they're defending. Right. I c- see, I but then, you, then, then later on, when the Japanese attack, they're clearly covering, out, they're coming out of a jungle and they have, you know, probably like 400 yards worth of, you know, open ground that they're covering. It, I think yeah. it's just the, the way that the, the scenes have been blocked, that they, they yeah. kind of forgot that they're supposed to be facing the bridge. Yeah, because uh, it it seems like the Japanese have like have, have already come over the bridge. Yeah, it's it's confusing. Exactly. So maybe, I I thought at one stage they were in like the gully underneath the bridge, like that's mm. where I thought they were defending because I thought that's the only way the Japanese troops would have got across. Yes, they'd have to go down the ravine and then up the other side of the ravine. But then there's some points where they're s- setting up machine gun positions above them. Yeah, and so there's there's a point where. Uh, there's a machine gun nest, a very precariously placed machine gun nest in a pair of trees. And, you know, there's about six Japanese guys up there, two, like three on the machine gun, two riflemen. And they've set up like some planks between two trees. And yeah. they're sort of like, and, you know, Lucky Grenade gets those guys. But how did how did they, unless they were on the other side of the ravine. It's confusing. Perhaps that position was on the other side of the ravine. I don't know. Because it's not 
super wide. The span of the bridge is probably like two or three arches, but it's very steep. So how did the Japanese get from that side? The geography is all over the shop. I mean, I know. <laughs> unless, unless this is this is my my outside theory coming into this. Is this is perhaps some headcanon that the Japanese have outflanked them at another pass further down the right. river? Okay, and they've they've pushed up this way. So, I oh, yeah, possibly. There's, there's a crossing further downstream or upstream. Um, that's you know you can get some men across, but not tanks or trucks. Yeah, exactly. Nothing heavy. Okay. But they need that bridge. They need right, that's yeah. the narrowest part of the ravine, and they need the bridge built. I'm going for that. That's yeah. that's how they got there. That makes sense. There's some foff headcan for Bataan. We like a bit. <laughs> we like a bit of foff making it up. Um, <laughs> they're entrenched by this point, mm. um, and they've got three um, heavy machine guns, which they do. are Vickers MGs. Um, they are. Unfortunately. Should be Browning in 1917s. Well, that's what MGM's fantastic armory had. Yeah. And if you've been looking at the Twitter, we've got a fantastic picture of um, guns from the MGM armory. Yeah, set in by a listener, Al. Yeah, amazing. Um, re- thanks for that, Al. It was brilliant. Um, check that out if you haven't. So we were trying to yeah. work out whether those weapons, the, the Vickers MGs that were in there, were the same as this one. I think they were. I think it's almost certain because it's another MGM movie. And they're quite clearly uh, Carl Vickers M1915s because mm-hmm. that's what that's what's shown in uh, the MGM photo, the armory photo. Mm-hmm. And obviously, I think what they've done is they've mocked them up with Browning um, smooth jackets, but yeah. they've quite clearly still got the two spade grips at the at the back rather than just the single pistol grip that Browning has. Well, there's a proper Browning at the start, isn't there? There is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's nice. In an anti-air roll, it's quite cool. That whole scene's brilliant. Brilliant. We'll come on to that later. So yeah, we've already alluded. They get picked off one by one, um, and and right at the end, you've got Robert Taylor on his own. Like he he, he gives him a drummer Thompson, doesn't he? The oncoming jabs, Good. um, and then he and he swings Empties the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely, just giving it some, and then it fades out. Of, um, the movie fades out with him sort of shouting at him to come to come get him, firing the yeah. Snickers gun, um, and then it and it it fades out, and um, the end scroll. Um, is so thought the heroes of Bataan, their sacrifice made possible our victories in the Coral and Bismarck Seas at Midway, on New Guinea and Guadalcanal. Their spirit will lead us back to Bataan. As uh, as MacArthur said, I will return. He did say, I will return. And John Wayne went back there. He did, in Back to Bataan. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like that end, end shot with the zoom in oh, on nice, the muzzle of the, of, the, of the MG. It's really quite effective. Mm. Mm. Um, and and the score over the top and the, the the boom of the gun it's really it really is effective. The sound design is actually really nice, isn't it? Time hasn't been kind to the print or the or the sound. The actual hit, look, you know, the listening to the sound isn't yeah. not very clear these days. Yeah, some of the sound effects actually reminded me of uh, films like All Quiet on the Western Front. You know, some of the whistling for the bombs and the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the rifle fire, some of that. You know, the original um, from the thirties kind yeah. of reminded me of that. The, uh, when the grenades go off, though, it looks like bloody, you know, an atom bomb's gone off. <laughs> yeah, we got that classic trope of grenades doing way more than they would oh, do. God, when they when they lob the two grenades at the the bridge to to just to get that truck, <laughs> it's like they've hit it with a howitzer, you know. So yeah, so there's a couple of things that scene. Uh, it's one of one of the ones I was going to bring up, and I was thinking, well, how have they managed to throw the grenades that far? And what is in those grenades? Because they they really go up. And they take out everything that the Japanese have built. So the, the yeah. base of the bridge is, is masonry. And then the top bit top is sort of like wood. It's like something. a deck, isn't it? Yeah. And they're, <laughs> yeah. Building, they're building it from the the trees they've put down locally. That's it, yeah. And it com- they completely destroy it with like a, maybe half a dozen grenades. Uh, that's a job for mortars. They should have had like a mortar team. Yeah, well, they didn't have barely anything, did they, them, them, them guys? Um they really should have had they that would have that would have been the, the ideal weapon for taking out what was after that bridge or rebuilt bit. They were fighting a defensive battle, so I assume they'd pretty might have exhausted some of their stocks. Um well yeah. I mean they were quite I mean the patrol, as they keep referring to it, um rather than patrol platoon or squad. But yeah, they don't patrol. <laughs> don't maybe patrol. that's maybe that's why they bought the, the rights to lost patrol. Oh maybe because yeah. they refer to it as a patrol. I don't know. They are really well armed. They have those three machine guns. They have mm-hmm. like three Thompsons, I think it is. Possibly. Something like four. that, yeah. Thompsons just keep appearing when it suits the plot. That's that's the role of any good Thompson in a war movie, isn't it? Really? Truth, yeah. Um plenty of grenades. 
uh, and and Springfield 1903s. And what I think is really interesting about Bataan in that respect is that it's one of the few films that show what Americans, what some American servicemen look like at the beginning of the war. So they're in 1917 pattern helmets. Mm. Uh, they've got Springfields. That's really interesting. I think yeah. it just it's, it sort of sets it apart from other. American World War II movies where, you know, they've all got the M1 helmet and they've all got the M1 Grand, you know, so kind of gives it a different visual aspect. Yeah, you know, they're only wearing webbing belts and sort of they've, they've you know, some of them got machetes because they're in the jungle and, mm-hmm. you know, they've, they haven't they have they have got like M41 jackets on yet or anything like that. It's just nope. got their shirts, the tropical shirt sort of look. So should we uh, move on to the alley tally this week? Yeah, I think, I think we can leap off into a number of sections from the alley tally. I think we can. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. So what's your pick this week, Robbie? Well, uh, we, we've already mentioned the, the Vickers guns. I mean, it's just always nice to see a lot of Vickers guns being, you know, being British, you know, mm. they love the Vickers gun wasn't necessarily Ali as like, oh, really cool bit of kicks. Obviously, we know that units had in, you know, dedicated heavy machine gun crews and teams and all that. But what I thought was only on the second watch earlier was the way that they actually used them, the MGs mm. because then they like knock it off. So like they have like a little burst and then I think it was... Um, Epps, yeah. Yeah, Epps, yeah. Yeah. He knocks off and then shoots like a burst and then knocks it off again. Mm, he does. He's kind of. I don't know why he does that. That's how you do it, isn't it? I don't know. We're well, gonna have to ask our friend Rich Fisher because he'll yeah. know much more about this than that and than we will. I remember watching a thing when I was little, and they said the was it Julian Thompson, one of his documentaries. He was like, oh, I was taught to fire a Vickers, mm. but you fire a burst, knock it off an inch, fire another burst. All right, okay. So it's like you're covering a field of fire. Yeah, that's it. It might be wrong. Yeah, I suppose. Well, some of them have clearly got the traverse like quick, like fairly loose. Oh yeah, they're, they're like proper raking it. They're, they're, they? they're sweeping yeah. with it almost. And he does seem to like tap the tap the spade grip yeah. to sort of like move it and traverse it left and right, doesn't he? No one's looking directly into the sights. They're like quite looking over, like over the gun. Yeah, they're firing but, over. Yeah, definitely. But actually, see what they're hitting. I quite like that. So many close-ups of them of them letting rip with the Vickers, though, aren't they? All the, really nice. The guns, but I think that I think the guns are almost one of the main characters. They get that much screen time. They, I mean, those guns are anyway because they're it's their only heavy weapon, mm. and and they make their they make a lot of their stands. They repel a lot of attacks in their Vickers gun pit, don't they? They do, yeah. Sorry, Browning pit. Um, <laughs> so my, my second one. And this is following on from last week a little bit. If you were if you're on the Twitter this week, we had the MP40 mystery, and then we solved the MP40 mystery of Go for Broke. Um, thanks, Al, again for that picture. There's another MGM mock-up gun. Late on in the film, there's a big hand-to-hand combat sequence, and this Japanese soldier jumps into shot, and he's got. A, well, I thought it was a Thompson. It's it's like a mocked-up Thompson with a really long barrel. And the barrel's a little bit f- like fluted. Yeah, it's supposed it? to. It's supposed to look like um, like machine gun, isn't it? Yeah, like a Type ninety six. But he doesn't even get to fire any shots off with it. He no. just he gets killed. Well, he gets killed in a spectacular way. He gets a rifle sling like wrapped around his throat. And <laughs> he does, yeah. You know that's that's one hundred and one for hand to hand fighting. That almost always make sure you get your, your rifle sling around the enemy's neck in order to strangle them. Absolutely brutal. Yeah, there's that. There's that great scene with. Um, uh, Dane, who he's hand to hand fighting with two or three Japanese soldiers, yeah, and he 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 breaks his rifle over one, and then there's another shot of him where you can quite clearly see that his both his bayonet is broken off, and the rifle stock is the butt's broken off his rifle stock, yeah, and and then he still shoots a Japanese soldier with the gun, you know, he just turns around and shoots him on the floor, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's some really visceral like hand to hand stuff. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, maybe we'll that's talk actually about my that. favorite scene, one of my favorite scene picks. So we'll we'll come back to that. Come I'm back sure. to but that. There is supposedly another mock-up gun, isn't there? Do you want to go into that one? Because I I don't believe it still. I I don't know. Like when I when I was when I was looking looking up the film, I noticed online on IMFDB, 
um, because we 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 only consult the, the the most quality of sources for this podcast. <laughs> we love a crowdsourced open source website that anyone can dot <laughs> there. To be fair, read them and then you can make your own decisions. You know, definitely. We're historians; we know what we're doing. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Apparently, um, Dane's 1911A1, his 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 Colt sidearm, is actually a mocked up revolver made to look yeah like a Colt 1911. Now, if you've ever seen a Colt 1911, you'll know that they look nothing like revolvers. No, especially famously. not like snub nosed uh, Colt detectives, which is what it's supposed to be inside this sort of like mocked up shell. And I thought that's bo- that's just bollocks. That's not that's not right. If you ever had a, a cap gun when you were little, it was a Colt detective. Mm-hmm. Little, <laughs> little plastic cap gun. They're all based on that. But I thought, no, there's no way. So I was watching it. I thought, okay, we'll come up to that scene where he, he shoots the 1911. You know, it's in the, in the middle of that set piece. Mm. And there's a number of enemy soldiers coming towards him and he shoots them from behind um, a fallen, fallen tree. And it's a really good scene. You know, it's a really good scene. Mm. Um, and I thought, Hang on a minute, that that colt's pretty fat. That is a fat colt. What's going on here? <laughs> it's a chunky boy, isn't it? When he... it's a, it was a thick colt. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this there's this like he sort of turns a little bit. Yeah. And it looks like a good inch and a quarter wide. And I thought, wow, okay. So maybe maybe there is this theory's got revolver legs. inside that. Yeah. I don't know what the source was for, for Al, di- like, like deciding that it was pictures from the armory. <laughs> That's definitely not in Al's um, no. photograph from the art room. Um, but I don't, I don't know how they worked out that there was a revolver inside. But I did notice when you look at it, the slide doesn't move and the hammer doesn't move. Okay, so that's a dead giveaway that the gun's actually not like cycling. Right, uh, fair enough. I think actually, I mean, you that. wouldn't necessarily see the slide move no. because it's quite quick. Yeah, that's the nature of semi-automatic handguns. But of course. You can you can get a good idea that something's not mm. quite right with this thick cult. I mean, if any if any foff listeners have got the movie on DVD or, or video, pop it in, have a look at that bit. Let us know. Um, again, we, we'll pop a picture up on the Twitter. I think when we do, um, yeah, we want your opinions because we think these MGM mock-up weapons are just crazy. They're fascinating. I love it. <laughs> like those mad lads in the MGM armory were just having a whale of a time, just like making up completely replica Sten guns, yes. making. Uh, Thompson's like Japanese Type ninety two like machine guns, <laughs> mocking up Brownings, just just having a great time. Oh, we need an MP forty for this film. Don't worry, don't worry. Stand in the machine shops making a casting of an MP forty right now. We'll just put a rising M fifty in there. No bother. <laughs> like just brilliant. In the, the you know the MGM like offices, you go like you know. Oh, I know. I need an M nineteen eleven. Oh, don't worry. I'll... I'll just go down the shop and buy one. It's, it's the most popular handgun in the world, probably at this point during the war. There's thousands of them. No, no, no. That's that's too easy. We we, we got to make one. <laughs> Stands a dab hand with a welding tool. He'll do it for you. <laughs> and he does a great job. Like that does it does for all intents and purposes <laughs> look great. exactly like a 1911. They, it had me fooled. Do you think like they got a real one, and, like pressed it in a resin mold, and then poured the liquid metal in, like really went over the top? I bet yeah. they did. You know, that's a good point. I bet that's probably how they did it because I can't think of how they got the detail. So, is could that could that be like some sort of maybe insurance thing where the actor's concerned? I, what, if you can fire a revolver, you can fire a 1911. Surely, it's really odd. If you're it? like mowing down Japanese soldiers with a Thompson, yeah. What's yeah. what's the issue with a Colt? Like, it's really odd, isn't it? So I don't see, I don't think it's going to be insurance, but it's so it's really though. bizarre. Unless it was like ammunition availability. Maybe they didn't have 45 blanks on hand. Oh, ah, possibly. Possibly. But wait, the Thompson's chambered in 45. So they would have yeah. 45 blanks. Oh, God. The plot thicker. So anyway, you try and look at this, it's kind of confusing. Well, maybe they would, those scenes were shot on a different day and they didn't have the armory mm, there. Well, maybe. We never get to the bottom of that one. I don't think. Maybe um, it was. Maybe it's a proximity thing where they were shooting close to other actors. Oh, uh, maybe. So they wanted to do it with a like a thirty-eight or a thirty-two. With a less less of a flash at the discharge. Yeah. That, that makes more sense. Yeah. But it's the it's the forties. They didn't care. No. But and why go to all the trouble to make a, a a housing for a revolver? Yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's impressive work. Very, and we love it. We love it on Foth. We love a bit of that. Um, so Matt, did you have any other Ali picks this week? Thompson's got to be the Thompson's. I mean, yeah, like that's it's just 
there's so much really great Thompson action. So the M1928 A1s, I think. Um, and they they have the original, so like pistol foregrip yep. and the big drum mags. Proper Chicago typewriters. Yeah. And we know the MGM Armoury had those because they're in the photo. There's so many great shots of the Thompson just absolutely mowing down enemy soldiers. Yeah. So, and the way they've all been these these shots have been have been uh, framed are really nice. So mm. they're either like uh, straight on ahead shots with the the guy behind the Thompson, and it's just blaring. Daka, daka. Or they're sort of sweeping shots where you can see what what you know. Yeah. And there's some really good one good shots uh, from behind them as well, mm. where they're stood on like the parapet and that he's hosing. Literally hosing down. Um, well, that's, that's just like pro America propaganda, isn't it? Yeah, and that's what that is, I think. Well, yeah, it's it's just it's an impressive sight, and they would have thought mean, yeah. that's impressive. This is like firepower. Yeah, I think and so. We want to we want to portray that the guys, you know, they've got the best available, and that you know they're doing what they can with that's it. Yeah, you know, a good old American Thompson. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so that's my pick. No, that's good. The never reloading trope is very strong as well. I don't mm. think I don't think I ever saw anyone reload those Thompsons. Never right. saw anyone put a fresh belt in any of the Vickers either. They did not. I mean, you have to cycle the bolt on a on a on a rifle anyway. So I mean, they did that. There is some of that though. I'll give them that. There is some. There is some like the cycling of of um of the Springfields, but you never see anyone putting like another stripper clip. No, you don't. Never. No. Um, and then I also really like um. At the end shot where where Taylor's, you know, he's he's he goes a bit mad, doesn't he? Because I think he's seen he's kind of like laughing, isn't he, when he's yeah. firing that Come Thompson. On. Yeah, he's got his grit in his teeth. Um, mm. but the camera zooms into the the Vickers gun that he's on, and he actually like mouths or shouts "sons of bitches," but it's drowned out by mm. all the machine gun fire. And apparently, at the time, that was a massive thing to get past the censor, because at the ah. time, probably quite a big swear. I'm not sure. On forty swears. I mean, I, I yeah, know I don't know what I don't know what like uh, American cinema regulatory no sort of things were going on in in the mid forties. But yeah, that's interesting. Fave scenes, fave parts. So, Max, we go first. There's some absolute crackers. Um, I mentioned earlier that it sort of goes first two acts are basically a character play where we get to know the men, yep. get to know each of the individuals. We'll talk a bit about that in a bit. Mm. Um, but it opens up with a really nice set piece scene and it's sort of the main set piece battle of the film is really impressive. I think it's like, I, I, I first watched this movie, I think when I, with my granddad when I was a kid, right. like a Saturday afternoon film um probably on tcm or something like that mm. and i i always remember it fondly and i really enjoy the film still like it's just a, it's just there's a nice bit of character development and then really really impressive so like set piece scene it's all studio bound yeah so we know that much i um, thought the start maybe wasn't no the uh, well the star definitely isn't and that's the so sort of like the exception to yeah um to it but that set piece, I really love it. So it begins with they sort of like realize that the trees are moving, That's and it. slowly the trees appear to be sort of like getting closer and closer to them, and the tension begins to ramp. You know, the first couple of shots, you're not blinking, you'll miss it. Then, yeah, the, the Japanese camouflage guys coming up. It's quite scary, really. Even for not, I mean, not now. It looks a bit well for then. It would have been, then you know, been it would like, have been something I definitely because like you, know. you know the they've had this drummed into them that, you know, you've got to fear the Japanese menace and they're sneaky and, you know, they're going to murder you. And yeah. we'll talk a little bit about the propaganda element of yeah. the film in a minute. Yeah. But so the tensions ramping, the enemy are coming up closer and closer. Mm. And um, Taylor, uh, Dane, Sergeant Dane tells them to fix bayonets. So they all fix yeah. bayonets. Uh, Robert Walker's character, the sailor makes a, a joke about waiting to see the, the white of their eyes. Mm. It's kind of like there's a little bit of a racist element to it. It's like, do they have? Do, yeah. Do the Japs have whites of their eyes? Yeah. Um, it's a couple of those little fairly like racist. We can forgive it. It was shot during tropes. the war. Well, um, it, it's literally propaganda. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Definitely worse propaganda, anti-Japanese propaganda than that. 
Mm. Um, yeah. And Dane's telling them to hold it. He's like, hold your fire, wait for him, wait for him. And then he goes like, one, two, okay. And they all open up. So there's a couple of Thompsons, three MGs going, and they absolutely blast the tree line. And the Japanese are like literally like right up on them at this point. And they absolutely lay the whole line of them down. Absolutely point and blank. And all hell breaks loose. Yeah. And it's yeah. it's just a hell of a scene. So you've got the chatter of the Thompsons, you've got the boom of the MGs, you've got grenades flying around everywhere, you've got stick grenades coming in, going out, you got um US grenades getting like pulled through the teeth and like they're just like lobbing them at everybody. But the, I like the way it's framed as well, because it's a nice mm. you can see that there's only three of them, four of them against this horde of Japanese troops. Yeah. And then they bring the fight in the US, the, the, the Americans, they bring the fight to the Japanese. I just think it's great framing. It's really nice. There's some really it nice is. shots. There's a couple of angles in there, isn't there? There's the shot over the heads of the men of the Japanese coming on. Yeah. And there's a sort of frontal shot of the guns firing. And then there's that great shot of when they sort of sally forward and do a bayonet charge. That's it, yeah. And that, and that just did develops into some absolutely brutal hand-to-hand combat for yeah, the time really visceral we got to talk about um kenneth spencer's character uh, private epps and how he dies because that is really striking mid uh, main battle sequence um they're all sort of individually fighting hand-to-hand yeah having a having a good time of it as well you know the, the odds are not on their side but no, you not. would never know it no. um no they're, they're mowing people down aren't they yeah and uh, we the cuts it cuts to Private Epps who parries a bayonet thrust, knocks a man down, bayonets mm. him, yeah, and then it snap cuts to his face as a Japanese officer's sword strikes the back of his neck, and he screams, and it cuts away instantly. Yeah, that's what you get. Yeah, it's it's really effective. Mm. Like, really, it's it's just it's just really impressive. Um, both on a uh, cinematography level, but also the fact that they they portrayed that kind of mm. visceral sort of like death. I mean, I know they I know they screened the movie to Bataan veterans, um, mm. and they approved it, and they said it's quite true. Um, but the, there's a New York Times critic called um, Bosley Crother, and uh, he said this time at least the studio hasn't purposefully prettified facts. This time it has made a picture about war in true and ugly detail. There is sickening filth and bloodshed in it. I only saw it the first time last week. And I was like, bloody hell, 1943. It's a blood-curdling scream as well. There's, there's quite a few really blood-curdling screams. Mm. I just, I think it's one of the first Japanese who gets bayoneted. I'm not sure who bayonets him, but you actually see him stick a bayonet in him. And I, and I was like, mm. really? Like, you do, hell. and he, he sort of like gets pushed to the side with the bayonet. Yeah. 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 And there's a lot of, you know, people get hit with rifle butts, you know, they're, they're really sort of, they're really playing that up saying, you know, mm. he's, you know, fighting the Japanese might get hand to hand. I mean, we, you know, a lot of accounts of that war. Well, it definitely did it, Bataan. Brutal. Yeah. That, yeah, that fighting brutal. retreat, you know, good. some of the stuff I've, yeah. I've read about that was just really, you know, so close quarters, just absolutely terrifying. I love that main sequence, but there is a slight criticism. Like right. some of the some of the sequences of the bayonet fighting look almost sped up. Okay. I don't know whether you picked up on that. No, but I there's didn't. some I bits that are no. almost comically sort of like sped mm. up. And there's a sequence where one of the men, don't know who it was because it's a shot from behind him, yeah. so you don't really see. But he throws his rifle at two oncoming Japanese men. Oh yeah. And it hits them, and they don't actually know what to do. They kind of fall over and then he and then he kicks them, but it's sped up and it just looks. Oh, I, think I have to go back and watch it. Um, it. Yeah, it's just there's only maybe two or three parts of that sequence that does that. Maybe they shot it slow because they were choreographing the throw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they just sped it up, but it's 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 off with the rest of the the sequence. But that's that's just something I noticed. So, what's your favorite favorite scene, Robbie? Well, so my favorite my favorite part is is the opening sequence where you've got the the stream of like refugees and retreating troops, um, and there's a couple of guys with a with a Browning M M1917, and they're just chatting away. The the two guys in the MG pit with their I think it's a captain or someone who comes to see them, mm. and then you hear a plane, and everyone looks up, and they sort of look up, sort of half sort of happy, maybe sort of curious, and then they 
quickly see that it's diving and you hear the plane start to dive and then you know mm. the the column gets shot up the 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 little shack hut, hut thing gets blown up um yeah and it's quite it's really well done the sense of scale of that sequence is really, yeah it's one of the few good. scenes i think aren't studio bound yeah it has to be because you can see you can see the distance and it looks real it's not a painted it's not a painted background no no but that whole sequence is amazing yeah so there's some elements in that that i i noticed that it's again it's really visceral and that kind of hints at what's coming later on oh it does yeah there's a guy with one leg missing badly wounded and he crawls under a building yeah. and the building's on fire and it collapses onto him yeah and it, and he has one of those blood curdling screams again mm. and it's just you're like wow okay there's also a jump cut to a buried child yeah god that a child that's land. been buried alive oh god yeah that hit mm. me i mean I, i'm a new father so i was a bit like yeah. oh no baby oh no well, exactly that is the whole point of the film yeah. it's designed to make you hate the japanese mm. and there's that also in that sequence the ambulance sketch uh, machine gunned yes it does yeah yeah i mean that i mean this is you know report like reading about Batan. you know it's, it, the japanese didn't hold their didn't have great conduct really in that well, they didn't have great conduct. I'm not saying any of it's but... not entirely accurate. No, I'm just no. saying it's shocking to a you know cinema goer. Mm. But it's representing, you know, something that the you know the the US government wants to portray is that the Japanese are ruthless, a ruthless enemy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's why we're fighting. Mm. And that's where the the propaganda comes into it quite heavily because there's a lot of derogatory terms about Japanese uh, soldiers. Yeah. It um, frequently refers to them as monkeys and, yeah. and baboons, doesn't it? Mm. But that's reflected in the propaganda of the time. You know, there's, there's you know, you look at the, the propaganda at the time, it's, it is rife, you know, <laughs> sort mm. of anti Japanese sentiment. And it's not nice to hear it in, in, in 2021, you know, but you've you got to look at it with, with 1943 eyes. You know, you're, you're trying to win a war. And I can, I can understand why they did it because it was, you know, trying to breed resentment to yeah. your enemy um, at home. So it, you know, it's um, it's of its time. I think you can't really blame it for that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of of uh, examples in the film, but probably, possibly, not as many as you might expect. There's a bit where Robert Taylor explains that they climb trees better than monkeys. That's it. Yeah. And you know, uh, and there's re- as I mentioned the references to baboons and such. It's like subtle. It's almost subtle at times as well. There's numerous like sort of mentions to the the Japanese culture. Um, yeah, it's about Bushido and all that. And there's little bits that they've interjected into the film. And there's the fact that you know they open fire on an ambulance that's killing wounded people. Yeah, so that's, that's meant yeah. to engender hatred towards your enemy that is mm. so ruthless. And I assume it would be backing up things that had been reported about the town at the time. Yeah, well, I mean, if you spray a column of of people walking. Mm. with um, machine gun fire in air attacks, then ambulances are going to get hit. Whether whether that was a policy, I don't know. But what I thought was interesting in that sequence itself was um, someone tries to take a rifle from a wounded man who's going into an ambulance and he refuses to let go. Yeah. So I took that as to be like, that man's so frightened of being unarmed in the face of, you know... Japanese, yeah. The Japanese... That he's he's wounded, but he's gonna he's keeping his rifle. The Bataan Death March was, you know, absolutely horrific, and um, you know, mm. very very well. Well, I don't know how well reported it was, but you know, I might assume it would have trickled through um, by by forty three. So, you know, I mean, it's showing what these guys actually did before. You know, they didn't they didn't just lie down, you know, and, and sort of get captured. They really did fight hard. You know, they were yes as a propaganda piece. I mean, I think it does its job. You know, it's it's a lot more in your face than say Miss Grant goes to the door. <laughs> yeah. But you know, Miss Grant wasn't staring down, you know, Banzai attacks. Um, she, she'd have done fine though. She'd have got, she'd have got her infield out and gone mad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she'd have got more with the Webley. I think it's also interesting that Kenneth Spencer has quite a good role in this. Like, mm his part is substantial. You know, he yeah. has some interesting sort of um, things to say in the film. Uh, you know, he, he's sort of a sort of uh, like a fatherly figure almost in some scenes. And, you know, he's just treated as an equal, you know, yes, he's just a part That's of the, the most part of the important squad. part. I think mm. sometimes in, in movies of that era, you get like subtle digs, you know, 
but you don't get any in this film. You just no. He's just Epps. That's who he is. You know, he's the demolitions expert. He's shown as quite caring and, as you say, like a fathery figure. He gives that really nice eulogy um, when the first first man gets picked off. I think um, mm. was it the captain? I think it was. I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Because mm. they they all look at Dane, don't they? Like, oh God, you're in charge now. Yeah. yeah. Some of the development of the characters is interesting. So they all have sort of like their own sort of personality traits. Uh, the sailor. Uh, is is massively irritating, and but he, he's, he's always young, talking. Man. I know he's young and naive, but he's always talking about. I'm gonna bag me a jab. I'm gonna get me a jab. You know, it's like, oh god, that right. gets very grating. Like his obsession with getting, you know, a kill is just so much. It's just too too much. Yeah, he's um, propaganda. I can understand it though. I can understand why they wrote it like that. Um, the cook's really good because uh, the cook is played by uh, Tom Duggan, and he's cook. Uh, Sam Malloy of the Motor Transport Service, and he's basically just spits all the time, which is exactly <laughs> what you want from a cook, isn't it? So he's spitting tobacco on the floor all the time, That's or it. juice, or whatever it and is. And after I think after Dane introduces himself to him, he just spits as he moves. So I'm like, oh, yeah. he really got him. I know, but he has he has one of the best lines in the film. So Dane uh, asks him like, "How's the ration situation?" And he says, "I'll tell you." There ain't no sugar for the coffee, and there ain't no coffee. <laughs> it's such a good line. It's really good. And, and later he shoots down a Japanese fighter with a Thompson. Yeah, he does. Absolute legend. But then he gets absolutely peppered by a machine gun across the river. They cram a lot in with those characters because then you've also got like, well, there's 13 of them for starters. You know, it's a big cast. It's a big cast. And they try and give everyone a little something, which is, you know, to their credit. It's easy to sort of like lose track of, of some of them. Yeah, I really did. I admit by the end, I was like, oh, okay, this is the three characters that actually mean something that are left. You can sort of tell who's going to be who's going to be last because they got more screen time. Mm. Um, yeah, it's true. So you had um, Robert Taylor, uh, Lloyd Nolan and uh, Robert Walker, yeah. the sailor. Because you have that whole sort of um, subplot of them fixing the plane. Oh, so two, two or three of them are always working on that. And then you have the, uh, the guy that, that gets come from? I, well, an airfield suddenly appears, <laughs> like right behind them. Yeah, like why aren't the Japanese landing on that airfield? So <laughs> weird, because he's like, oh, and is it is it? Oh, not Sal- Salazar. Yeah, he goes, mm. oh, I'll I'll go back to headquarters and get get some air strikes called in. Um, see yes. you later. Yeah, and then I'm like, well, hang on, no, because there's an airstrip behind you, mate. <laughs> What they fuck? know they know they're there, but he then disappears without orders. So he yeah. goes he goes AWOL. Yeah, he does, and then yeah. later on, tragically, like in the next morning, he's like been, been caught by the Japanese and is strung up from a tree. Yeah. And the sailors, you know, all gung ho trying to like open up on him, thinking he's a Japanese soldier. I mean, the only thing I like about that plane se- sequence that I think is a bit is very weird, um, is the fact that that is a weird plot point. It adds sort of plot holes. Yeah, it does. And then, but the the good when it dives into the bridge and explodes, and that looks good. That model sequence is brilliant. Like, really good. The model work on the film is really oh, good. It's fantastic. Like, I, it? The scene where the the enemy fighter plane crashes, that's good. Oh, that's good. The well. scene where they blow the bridge, that's great too. Mm. And they do at least sort of set up that bridge with a real scene shot. Like they walk across it. The captain and Dane walk across it. And yeah, they do. The yeah. captain sort of like explain the, the mission, and you know. But then I don't think the fact that the film is is sort of like on a soundstage is a huge negative anyway, because it's very well dressed set, very atmospheric when that fog rolls in. Oh yeah, and you get all the graves. Oh god, yeah, that's mm-hmm. it's foreboding. That's very, I mean, it's, it's good. Um, it's good foreshadowing as well for for everyone um, when you start seeing the graves. That's that's quite good. But yeah, maybe, maybe we're getting into final thoughts now, I think, possibly. So as last week, I mean, I'll, I'll kick off, but as was with um, Go For Broke, I, I just found it was too long. I, I enjoyed it, don't get me wrong. You know, the, the, the end battle sequences are really good. The start's really good. Int- introduction to all the the the, 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 the squads, really interesting. Mm. And then it, to me, it sort of gets bogged down and they're like, 
own personal little wars and things and yeah. some characters i'm not really warm to others i just couldn't have told you what the hell they did you know well they don't have enough time like no they don't well, it, they've got two you, hours you blink and miss the reference to the the medical orderly's pacifism possibly cut the plane sequences as well because it's just a bit weird yeah, I mean, I think the only reason the plane sequence and plot point is in there is purely because they wanted a way to destroy the bridge more a second time after the demolition and the hand grenades. And then that explains why it's never brought up again because it really is put out of action. But then, on a po- but then, then again, on a positive note to me, it reminded me of Battleground and Go For Broke because there's a lot of sort of setting up, a lot of mm. soldiers being soldiers, talking about mm. things that aren't war to then yeah. have a big old battle at the end. It's that classic sequence of events, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a love-hate relationship with these the couple of movies we've done um, in the last couple of weeks. I really like them, but I also find them really irritating as a... And I think this is me as a... I don't know if I alluded to it last week, but me as a... Uh, I'm you know, 28, nearly. Me as a movie watcher now sort of isn't the movie audience of 1943... Because I've got, you know, we've got TV, we've got streaming, we've got YouTube. Yeah. We can skip to the good Everything bit. has a plus 30 second yeah, button. It, exactly. So I'm not going to the cinema to sit down because I know... Well, we're definitely not right now, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I know I'm not consuming my only media at the cinema. Mm. So like I'm sitting in for the news, then I'm sitting in for the the, pit, the cartoon, then I'm going to watch the big feature. Mm. Like I have the option just to get up and go make a cup of tea and then come back and all that. And I think that's probably why I'm not enjoying these as much. But yeah, that's my, that's my 10 cents on, <laughs> on Patel. I enjoyed it. I mean, it's a film I've seen as a kid. Yeah, because I know you've got more of a resonance with it. Mm. Like I, I watched it with my granddad years and years ago. And I, whenever it's on, I always like, I always sit down and like, watch it because mm. it's just, it's an enjoyable film. Yeah, then, yeah It's a classic Last Stand movie. Um, it's an enjoyable like Sunday afternoon film. Yeah. Where you can sort of like, be doing something else at the same time and then, you know, pop back for the, you know, pop into it now and then. Or it's got a good cast. You know, the, the characters are it has. fairly well developed if there's too many. But yeah. some good set pieces. So it's a solid film. And I, I think that whole propaganda element is interesting. It kind of comes to a head towards the end with um, Todd slash Burns. Um, Dane and the sailor where the sailor's been wounded and uh, Todd writes him a letter home and he, you know, he breaks down when he realises they're all going to die because there's no escape from the situation Yeah, and uh, Dane takes over writing for him we figure the men who died here have done more than for the people of the world will ever know it doesn't matter where a man dies as long as he dies for freedom so that's that's a great line but it's it's quite clearly something that you know it's a it's a propaganda line like the redeeming feature of the movie is that it is it's as i said earlier it's of its time and that is really interesting to see a movie made during a, the war that it's it's portraying even you know even if it is narrative even if it is fictional fictionalized bad, a little bit yeah it's not a bad film i just i have issues with it as a current day movie goer but what can you do <laughs> Yeah, it's not it's not there as one of those all time great war movies. No, I no, agree with that. No. But it's enjoyable and yep. it's probably one of the few on screen depictions but we'll ever get of the Battle of Bataan, which is yes. important. Yes, and there are very there are fewer movies about those more obscure um, early early sorts of campaigns. And I think it's important that those films exist because they kind of hopefully make people go, I want to know a little bit more about mm what this is portraying so they go and read about it yeah that's my hope always anyway i always know it's a good film if it if i'm myself like sat watching it thinking yeah i really want to go and like look up more about this i want to go and find what books are good about this uh fire and fortitude by john mcmanus that's a really good film um film that's a really good book for the uh, pacific campaign with the u.s army um mainly being featured in that there's a lot on Bataan um in that uh, book so i'd really recommend that Oh, great. So there we have it, everyone. That's our, uh, that's our look at Bataan this week. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed it. I mean, it's really worth a watch. Um, it's a bit hard to find, I must admit. Coming from 1943, there's not a lot of good copies out there. Um, but, you know, please seek it out if you can. We're always available on the Twitter, at Fighting on Film. Give us a like, um, a review, 
a subscription on whatever you're listening on and we'll catch you next time thanks for listening guys 